Lieutenant Chamber, program signed. Okay, members. Um, if members can do the needful with any electronic uh, devices, and if members are content, the oral evidence sessions today will be recorded um, by Hansard. And if there's any um, declarations of financial or other relevant interests related to, to today's proceedings, now would be the appropriate time to declare it. Okay, with apologies from Emma Rogan. Um, and I'll ask the clerk now if any member has delegated their vote under the relevant standing order. Um, thank you, Chair. Man, Emma Rogan has delegated her vote uh, under standing order 1156 to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. And it forwards the draft minutes of the meetings that were held on the 30th of June and the 2nd of July, pages 27 to 31 of your meeting pack for the draft minutes of the 30th of June. And if members are content that they are a true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting, then uh, please indicate and I can sign them accordingly. Content. Okay, Great. Thank you. Um, then pages 32 to 37 of the meeting pack are the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 2nd of July. And if members are content again that they are a true reflection of proceedings, then please indicate and I can sign accordingly. Great. Great. Okay, matters arising. There's a number of items arising, and I'll just take members through them. Item one is a response from the Minister of Justice on Clause 10 of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. Uh, pages 39 to 43 of the meeting pack has the relevant correspondence, um, as well as requesting legal advice on legislative competence issues raised by the former Attorney General. Uh, John Larkin QC in relation to Clause 10 of the Bill. The Committee agreed to request the position of the Minister uh, of Justice on the matter. The Minister has responded, indicating that the issue has been robustly considered on a number of occasions with her legal advisers and Legislative Council, and the Minister remains of the view that the clause is within the legislative competence uh, of the Assembly. So, Members, uh, it is there for uh, noting. Uh, and obviously, it will inform the committee's deliberations on the bill in due course. Members are content. Item two: um, There is a response from the department on the issues raised by the committee on the proposed consultation um, on proposals to amend legislation governing retention of DNA and fingerprints, pages 44 to 71 of the meeting pack. Uh, at our meeting on the 23rd of June, the committee considered a written briefing paper from the department on a proposed targeted consultation on a package of biometric provisions which would amend the legislation governing the retention of DNA and fingerprints. The committee advised the department that it wanted a full public consultation on the proposed changes unless there was an overriding rationale not to do so, and requested further information on the proposed targeted consultation. The department has responded, indicating that it uh, remained of the, while it remained of the view that the proposed targeted consultation uh, was likely to include or, all organisations with an interest in this area, in light of the committee's views, um, it is carrying out a full eight-week public consultation, and it also provides a copy of that uh, consultation document. So, members, it's there for noting the department will provide a summary of the results of that consultation on its proposed way forward in due course to the committee, and then we can pick up the issue at that point again. Item three, um, the, the uh, five-year action plan on stopping domestic and sexual violence and abuse strategy, pages 72 to 82. At our meeting on the 30th of June, the committee noted information provided the department on key actions to be uh, included in the year five action plan relating to the stopping of domestic abuse and sexual violence and abuse seven-year strategy, the timescale for publication of the action plan and a progress report against the year four action plan. The committee agreed to give further consideration to both when uh, they are available. The action plan and report were published in early July, and they will be included on the agenda for consideration at a future meeting of the committee. Item four uh, is a response from the minister on the victims' payment scheme, pages 83 to 99. Um, at our meeting on the 30th of June, the committee considered correspondence from the department regarding the victims' pension scheme and requested further information on a range of issues relating to the potential procedures or mechanisms to deliver the scheme and the interactions with other departments and ministers. The minister responded to the uh, committee on the 10th of July. Uh, since that date, there have been further developments, and the Department of Justice is now designated as the responsible uh, department uh, to deliver the scheme. 
So if members are agreed, um, I'd seek to schedule an oral evidence session with uh, the Department on the processes and other arrangements that are to be put in place and the timescale for these at a future meeting of the committee. Paul Frey. Yes, uh, I would agree with that, Chair, uh, and support that call. Uh, can I just add something that's troubling me as I've read this? Uh, page 84 of our PACs, uh, the Minister states there that they did not expect a response from the Permanent Secretary, David Stirling. Um, and it was the letter from Peter May was just to inform the discussion. Uh, really, is that where we're at with regard to civil service land? Uh, so the minister's statement that there is no response from the permanent secretary. Now, I don't know, but when you write to someone, you expect some sort of response, even an acknowledgement. And I want to know why it is the case that when a permanent secretary writes to another permanent secretary, that there is no formal response given. Um, that's the first thing, uh, and that's in the first paragraph on page 84. The second paragraph on page 84, again, it seems to be the case that the First Minister and Deputy First Minister hasn't responded to the Justice Minister. Now, again, I think that's shabby work. It seems to be that the Executive Office, given what it's been through over the last month or two, is just a waste ground of a department, uh, and victims demand action now, and for ministers not even to respond to another minister does not bode well for the future. Uh, also then on page 88, uh, if I can get it up, the, 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 minister, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister's response to this committee uh, – hold on just to make sure that I'm right – maybe it's the Justice Minister. The Justice Minister doesn't respond to any of our detailed uh, questions um, around the position in respect of civil pr premises, uh, if any have been identified. Now, all of these things, whilst they were waiting, could have been ascertained. And, and it seems to be the case that none of that has been addressed or answered. And, and surely there has been work being done in a preemptive way to ensure that whenever a court case was settled, that all of this could be resolved, uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not satisfied by the responses that uh, the ministers have given to this committee, even to uh, from Minister uh, Long, and her letter dated the 7th of July. Now again, I know it was pre-court case, but surely she should have addressed some of the points that we raised in our letter, your letter, Chair, on the 3rd of July, and. That's not satisfactory in my eyes, the response that we've received. So I think we need to put the pressure on this, and I think we need to crank up the pressure to ensure that this gets rolled out as soon as possible. Thank you. Rachel. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to concur with um, an oral briefing, but also we've still got the big unanswered elephant in the room, which is the, where the funding is coming from. Um, so I don't if, just if the, if the committee could could write to the Secretary of State um, if that's an option and we could get an update on the funding. I know there's 2.5 million here, but where is the funding coming for the actual payments? Um, because payments need to be made, you know, as soon as possible, rather than um, just concentrating on getting the system set up, which are absolutely important to do so. But the big question is where where is the payments coming from? Doug? Uh, no, no, Chairman, I mean, all I would say in, in, in answer to that, I, I, I don't think there's a business case been put in yet in regards to the funding for this, um, and I think that's one of the big pieces of work that um, uh, the Justice Department's going to have to do to, to, to identify that uh, and put that forward. I mean, funding is, is a big issue, but um, I mean, it needs to happen sooner rather than later. Linda? A, a number of issues. I suppose the first one is. I am not disagreeing with what Paul is saying, but I think to preempt a legal, the outcome of a legal case is not necessarily a good thing to do. In terms of the, the funding, I think we should write to the Minister and ask for an update on what, what discussions and conversations are being had around that. But I think it, it is difficult to make a business case in light of the fact that it hasn't even been established yet who is going to be entitled to this, and, and that's because of the mess that was made of it, to be perfectly honest with you. And I think that that, I would like to think that those negotiations are still ongoing in terms of who will actually be entitled 
and who will be excluded. And I think, given the uncertainty around that, it is going to create some issues. And I think that people have given a lot of victims out there false expectations, and we need to be honest with them and tell them that at this moment, we don't know where the funding is coming from. We don't know what the funding is going to look like. We don't know who's included, who's excluded. If we're being perfectly honest about it, and I think that those are all issues that we need to address, and we need to be honest with the victims, because creating false expectations of payments going to come in a month or six weeks or two months is unfair to them. We need to be very, very honest with them, and we need to establish what the facts are before we can be honest with them. So I think we need to find out from the minister where where it's at in terms of conversations around all of those issues. And I would like that all of those issues are put in a letter to the Minister, not simply the Fountain issue, but, but the issues around negotiations and discussions on who will be eligible and who won't. Okay, members, there's a number of points just to... Chair, could I just... There is. Yes, sorry, Gordon. You all right, make it just a couple of points. I think we all... Well, I understand we're all agreed that this is a priority and it needs to move forward as swiftly. Um, the victims have, innocent victims have suffered for, for too long, their families have suffered too long. Um, the issue has dragged on far too long. It needs to be dealt with promptly. The issue of who is, is going to get the funding has been debated extensively. Um, there will be a robust appeals process put in place, and those that feel that they've been uh, missed out or badly treated are able to go through that process, and no doubt um, those will be, people will be well represented at such appeals. But I do feel we need to um, give people some reassurance. The courts have made a decision on this, and we are here as the Justice Committee. It's important we um, honour what the courts have done as part of the Assembly and part of the Executive and use the, our influence to make sure that the matter is now progressed to a, a satisfactory conclusion. And um, it is important that victims, especially those innocent victims, are compensated in a reasonable and a prompt manner. And I trust this committee will move to see that justice is at last being done. Can I just clarify yes, a point? Ma Sorry, Chair. Um, just to, to say that the, the victims, this is not a mess of the victims making. And I do believe that as soon as payments can be made to those severely injured, they absolutely have to be, regardless of any ongoing negotiations around who's eligible or who's not. And we're the Justice Committee. It's not for us to decide who are innocent victims. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I'd just like to um, make a point that um, I accept Paul's interpretation of some of the content there from the correspondence from the Minister, but not all. I do, although she referred to a letter, I get the impression she provided a briefing paper which was brought forward to a victim's group, and it was a timely paper which I presume she stipulated didn't require response. But yes, there are serious questions then on other regards to um, how communication is flowing. But in regard to, um, I really welcome the fact, I know that the Minister's offer was taken up and that the Department have now been commissioned with the task of building up an administration that would channel and funnel and distribute that money to victims. The sooner the better. Um, but let's not pretend that we don't know that the question is, where is the money? And perhaps as a committee, it's on us to try and put some speed into this. Um, I, I think the proposal to contact the Secretary of State, the Executive Office and the Minister to really understand the terms of reference of what was commissioned to her. Because my understanding is the commission was to build up the apparatus, but there was no reference to the money. So it may be worth actually having that detail at committee level. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Um, okay, members, well, I I'm keen that we get the, the senior officials to the committee as soon as possible on this, um, because some of these issues we need to tease out. Um, we can go backwards and forwards in letter exchanges, and, and I'm not so sure that that will expedite the matter 
um, as quickly as, as I would like it to be. I would like to have the Minister come to address this issue, but in fairness, I think uh, we, we, as a committee, need to get our head around exactly what it is the Department is being asked to do and how they are going about doing it. And then I am happy that we would get the Minister to come up. Um, so it is not that I am wanting not to say let, let's exchange in, in letter writing. I have no problem with that. Um, but there's a number of issues. One is the the actual logistics of the department and what they're being asked to do. Then there's how is it going to be funding. Then there is another piece about the eligibility of this and the ongoing debate around who's going to be entitled to it. Um, and I don't want that aspect of the debate to distract from how the department has to go about its job in terms of delivery and also how the funding is going to come about. So, If members are agreed, we will seek to get the lead officials on this to come before the committee as soon as possible, as that can be arranged, and we will fit that in um, as part of our, our programme of work. Um, I have no objection to the procedural points that Paul has raised about the lack of detail in the letters. Um, I'll give a little bit of latitude because of the court case and, and so on, but I, I think there were, those are procedural points that are well made. Um, and, and something that I think can be considered uh, with officials. But in advance of them coming up, the discussion here will be put together as a note, um, and we will supply that to say here's the areas that members have raised, and that will be subject to the discussion when they, whenever you come up. Is there is there a particular point members feel around the funding that we should expedite? Uh, I'm happy that we would write to the Secretary of State. I note his comments. I think in the House of Commons yesterday which was it can be paid out of the block grant to Northern Ireland. Um, but I'm happy if the committee wishes to, to formally write to the Secretary of State and the Executive Office and the Minister for Justice about the funding aspect of this and the other areas we'll compile as a note um, for officials to deal with when they come to the committee. Is that a way forward? Great. Great. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll write around the funding concerns um, to the Executive Office Minister for Justice and the Secretary of State. The other points that have been made we will compile as an area that needs to be discussed um, by the departmental officials when they come before the committee, and we will seek to, to do that as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, item 5 uh, is further information on EU exit and justice-related issues. During the oral evidence session with the Department um, on the 2nd of July on these areas, uh, we agreed to the Department agreed to provide additional information. Uh, in response, the Department has advised the UK is attempting to negotiate bespoke arrangements to provide similar capabilities in three key areas, including extradition and mutual assistance, operational tools, data sharing systems and EU agencies such as Europol and Eurojust. Uh, the response details the UK's negotiating goals, contingency plans, should these not be achieved, and the implications for Northern Ireland of either scenario. The Department um, will keep the Committee informed of developments as these emerge, and the Department also advises the correspondence on the Common Frameworks is expected to be issued by the Executive Office Ministers, although a date for this is currently not yet been established. So, if members are content, we'll note the additional information um, that we had requested. Uh, this will be an ongoing area of work for the foreseeable future for the committee, and we will consider it as those issues emerge. Okay. Yeah. Right. Item six is a response from the speaker and the first and deputy uh, first ministers regarding the attorney general vacancy, pages 124 to 132. The committee agreed to write to the assembly speaker and FMDFM regarding any implications of the absence of a permanent office holder for the role of AG, um, particularly in relation to the role of the attorney in the legislative process, and to request information on interim arrangements, timescale, and appointment process for a permanent replacement. Speaker has indicated that he is not aware that an interim appointment causes any difficulty in relation to the Assembly's legislative process. And the Executive Office have also advised that the Interim Attorney General, Ms Brenda King, will undertake the full range of functions of the Office, and there should be no impact on the legislative process within the Assembly. Um, they also have advised that there will be an open competition for a replacement Attorney General, which will be based on the principles that apply to public appointments. Um, the correspondence also addressed the independence issue, and it's noted that the interim AG um, 
is no longer the Office for Legislative Council, I think is the I just took a career break or um, in sure. terms of that. Can we ask for an update just on, on where the they're at in terms of the appointment? The appointment, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, can I add then? Uh, who replaces Brenda King in her previous role? Mm-hmm. Because this creates a domino effect, uh, and I think we need to ascertain that. I'm not sure it's actually the remit of this committee for that. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe the executive office committee, uh, but it does create a it creates a space if if uh, one individual is taking a career break to uh, fulfil the role of Attorney General. Uh, so who then replaces in the King in her previous role? Yeah, we can ask. I think you're right. I think it's 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 more an executive. But it, listen, the the office for legislative council drafts the legislation for all departments, um, and is involved in that process. So that's a valid point that I think I have no objection to raise. So we'll we'll get an update on the um, recruitment process and also um, how the uh, the role of legislative council um, is being handled. Okay. Um, item six. Then, if, if if members can note then the responses, um, then we'll move to item six, which is the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill, um, research papers and clause twelve, defence on grounds of reasonableness and on information sharing between police forces and the Home Office. Uh, pages 134 to 148. The committee commissioned two research papers, the first relating to clause 12 and the defence on grounds of reasonableness, and the second on arrangements governing the sharing of information in relation to migrant victims of domestic abuse to assist with our consideration of this bill. So it's their members in terms of the documents for, uh, to note, and that will inform then the committee's deliberations on the bill uh, in due course, unless members have any other uh, questions in respect of that research paper that they require further information. It's worth reading. Yeah, Linda? Um, just in terms of the, the stuff on the reason of defence was very good. But in terms of 6.2, the PSNA sharing information with the Home Office, from reading the papers, they don't have to, mm-hmm. but guidelines, they're following guidelines, which means they do share information, which I think actually is impeding people from reporting domestic crimes. So I think that we should write to the the chief constable and the policing board just to get clarity around why exactly they follow that guidance whenever it potentially is preventing victims from coming forward. So I get that that if somebody is possibly breaking immigration law that they might feel they have some responsibility but there's no onus on them to do it and they're potentially allowing crimes to go undetected by doing it so they, they have to look I think you have to look at this in the round and say whereas you know in terms of their own role PSNA role and not the home office role in terms of PSNA role what is their priority and their priority should be to detect crime and then to ensure that they punish those who are, who are carrying out that crime. In this case, we're talking about domestic and, and sexual violence. So I think that um, we, should, we should write to both the Chief Constable and the Policing Board just to get clarity on, on why they follow that guidance. Okay, I'm happy to do that. It, it's worth noting Chief Constable's coming to the committee on the 24th mm-hmm. September. I think it'd be helpful even to write that he's aware that it's something that we're probably going to yeah. ask him about. It certainly is something I'm going to yeah. be raising, but it, it, it probably would be beneficial. And I think the policing board should be aware that that's the current position as well. Jerica, if I could add to we're we're having to go at two speeds here because whilst there will be people uh, coming up before us, we'll have to work on the pace of the bell itself. So it's, it's better if we're going to do something with regards to amendments that we're getting that earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we probably will need to write to him sooner rather than later to try and form some sort of established <coughs> uh, mindset within the uh, committee. Okay. Well, I'm I, I'm I'm happy that the issue is raised. Um, 
it's that balancing act of you know do you deter some people coming forward to report a crime um, but if the police are in possession of information as a result of people coming forward that may relate to other crimes how are they managing that process um, and it, it, they've obviously followed guidelines in respect of that where there's no legal compulsion on them to do it um, but I would like to know a little bit more of the rationale for that because it may well be one that's compelling um, but I'm not in a position to make a judgement on that. Yeah, no, um, exactly what, I, what, I, what I'd like to get as well. So, so uh, um, if, if we raise to find out just what is the, the overriding considerations whenever they're passing on information to the Home Office, what's the judgement call there and the criteria that's used and, and making that kind of determination. Um, okay. Item 7 then. Um, domestic abuse family proceedings, uh, an update to, the, to where we're at, pages 151 to 255. Um, the committee had requested additional information on a range of issues relating to the bill, and these have been received. The requests and responses are detailed at paragraph 3 of the clerk's memo um, on pages 151 to uh, 153. Uh, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, the Bar of Northern Ireland and Women's Aid Federation have also provided further information following the oral evidence sessions and the Department of Justice has provided a copy of correspondence from the Minister to the UK Minister for Small Business, Consumers and Labour Markets regarding a review into support in the workplace for victims of domestic uh, abuse. Um, so at this stage, members, there's a lot of information in that, but I'm asking that that information uh, is noted. Um, and it will be drawn on as required to inform the committee deliberations on the bill and the specific issues um, over the coming weeks. <clears throat> um, the, the committee stage um, of the bill has to be completed and, and reported, um, agreed upon before the 15th of October, and a timetable for committee consideration of the bill and agreement of the report has been provided on pages 157 and 158 and the focus of the committee during uh, the month of September will be on this work and the session today focuses on the provisions of the bill and then there will be a separate session to consider the range of issues that are not currently covered by the bill and that's going to be scheduled for the 17th of September. Okay, so the committee did agree to hear directly from a number of individuals who have suffered domestic abuse and who had indicated in their written submissions that they would be willing to discuss their experience with the committee. Um, four informal meetings were held before the summer recess. Notes of these meetings are currently being finalised with the individuals and will be circulated in the near uh, future. Seven further meetings are due to take place in the next number of weeks. There has been a number of additional requests from individuals to meet the committee. Um, they were received during the, the summer period and details uh, are included in paragraph 9 on page 154 of the uh, meeting pack. Uh, so members, we have a number of meetings still um, to take place with a number of individuals. We have um, very limited time now to complete um, the stage stages that are required. Uh, and it's my view that it isn't feasible to accommodate any more requests um, to hear from individuals uh, in order to carry out that work, pull together the, the report, agree all of that, um, and the areas that we have already agreed to hear covers all of the wide range of issues that have came before us. Um, so uh, whilst I appreciate members do want to continue to provide evidence to this committee, there comes a point where you need to draw a line. Um, and it's my clear recommendation that that line has already been drawn and uh, we need to continue with the timetable as currently outlined. Um, so I don't believe it's feasible to schedule any further meetings at this stage in respect of the, the bill. Um, so members, we're going to be looking at uh, the session today around the main aspects of this bill. In two weeks' time, all of the issues where members may want to provide amendments um, to add to it, that will be in two weeks' time. Um, so start thinking now, what are those areas that you're wanting to bring in addition to the bill where the committee may get consensus and adopt it as a, a committee amendment to it? Um, so that will be at the meeting in two weeks' time. 
where all of those issues that currently aren't in the bill that evidence has suggested should be included, um, that will be the committee meeting where we're going to have that um, consideration and discussion um, and see if we can start identifying where the committee um, can take those forward. Um, that may not be through consensus, preferable if it is, but it may not be. And then ultimately members are um, at liberty to bring forward their own individual amendments um, outside of the, the committee um, process. So if members are content with that update, we'll move on to item 8, which is the oral evidence session then from the Department of Justice and Police Service officials, and we'll invite them to, to take their place. The Department and uh, the PSNI, uh, this is obviously entirely related to the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, um, and to answer members' questions. Now, there's a table setting out the key issues that have been raised and the Department's written responses, and they're on pages 259 and to 446 of the meeting pack, and um, members will want to obviously explore during this evidence session, um, issues that have been set out in the clerk's paper, and the clerk's paper is in the tabled pack. Okay, so if members haven't had a chance to have a look at the tabled pack, pages three, four, and five are the relevant um, sections for members, and uh, we're going to go through members um, clause by clause in terms of the structure. So if members don't have a question on clause one then and their question relates to clause five for example if you can wait till clause five um, it'll be the best way to try and keep this uh, structured so can I welcome uh, Veronica Holland um, to the meeting head of violence against the persons branch within the department Jane McGuire head of family courts and tribunals branch from the Department of Justice and Anthony uh, McNally uh, acting Detective Chief Super Superintendent from the Police Service to the meeting. Um, you're all very welcome. Um, and this session will be recorded um, by Hansard. A transcript of it will then be published on the committee webpage in due course. Um, members, again, just emphasise that this session focuses on the current provisions of the bill and there will be the opportunity to explore all of the other issues that are not currently in the bill at our meeting, which will be separate to this on the 17th of September. So I'm going to ask uh, officials if there's anything in addition to what has already been provided that they wish to draw to members' attention, rather than asking officials to give us an overview of their submission, because that's a pretty lengthy document for members to go through. So if there's anything official, in addition to that, please feel free to add to it. Or if Nothing from me, Chair. You're content? Okay. Okay, well, members, let, let's move in um, in respect of Clause 1, in respect of the areas that we want to consider at this stage. Is there questions, members, that you want to, to raise around this aspect? If we can go to the department, if you just want to give a, a brief outline then on clause one, and then I'll let members just take a look at that. Clause one, that provision is essentially, I suppose, setting out the crux of the offence in terms of what it constitutes. So it's abusive behaviour, two or more occasions, um, and that the, the conditions have been met in, um, in, in relation to that. So as I say, that, that's essentially kind of the, the core of the offence in, in terms of what the criteria are around it. Okay, um, so if I can just ask then around the approach that the department here has taken, um, rather than the, the approach that Westminster has taken, do you want to just comment on the, the differing approaches? It's taken in relation to this. I suppose in, in terms of the UK more widely, um, and also the Republic of Ireland in, in terms of the approaches that have been adopted there, Republic of Ireland and England and Wales have a different approach to the one that we have. Um, we've reflected the approach that was adopted in Scotland. Um, our offence obviously covers both um, physical violence as well as non-physical abuse of individuals. We felt that this was a more comprehensive um, approach. We felt that it was more robust um, in the England and Wales provisions. Um, it doesn't explicitly cover violent behaviour. It would simply be, for example, controlling an, a coercive behaviour or, or non-physical abuse of, of an individual. So we felt it was important to 
be able to encapsulate both of those elements within a single domestic <coughs> defence rather than having to take forward um, a number of charges. And obviously that's also reflected in terms of the maximum penalty that can be given um, for the offence. We also have provision within the offence that harm doesn't necessarily have to be caused to the individual. Um, and I suppose, as we've alluded to in the table, I think one of the um, most high profile or, or public examples in relation to that is really in relation to Luke and Ryan Hart, whose father killed their mother and sister. Um, they would have said after that incident happened that it was only when they were in the police station um, and seen some posters in relation to controlling and course of behaviour that they actually became aware that they were suffering from domestic abuse. So in, in that type of scenario, those individuals aren't aware that that's what they have been subject to, that there has been abusive behaviour. Um, you know, so, so we wanted to, to try and ensure that in those types of scenarios where an individual either isn't aware that the behaviour is abusive or equally where that behaviour has become so normalised um, that they don't view it as abusive or, or view it as harmful, we wanted to try and ensure that those um, cases could also be encapsulated within the offence. So that's essentially the, as I say, we followed the approach that's been adopted in Scotland rather than the, the England and Wales model. And that, that takes me on to another question around then the definition issue. Um, the, the policing board has highlighted this. The Attorney General and others have said about the, it being so broad in scope that there's the danger then it doesn't actually give the effect that, that you know, we would all want it to give effect to. Do you want to just comment then around the, this the definition aspect of this and any of the conversations with the, the relevant stakeholders and PSNI in respect of that? I suppose in, in terms of, you know, we've obviously heard the, the comments and concerns that have been raised during the evidence sessions in relation to this. I suppose from our perspective, we would be of the view that ultimately the crux of the offence is, is there abusive behaviour? Everything has to come back to you and boil down to that. So really, I suppose the, the purpose of the provisions in terms of setting out what is deemed to be abusive behaviour and what is the effects of that behaviour, that is intended to provide clarification, further information, to give certainty so people can be clear in terms of what types of abusive behaviour we are looking at. Um, and, and obviously we wouldn't want to lose that, that information or that detail. We think it's important in terms of that certainty and clarity for both those that are affected by abusive behaviour and those that may be subject um, to this offence. But as we say, ultimately, in the absence of that or if that weren't there, everything has to come back down to is there abusive behaviour and, and that additional information, as you say, is intended to provide further clarity, certainty and, and um, a, a structure in relation to what that abusive behaviour may look like. Okay. Linda? Just I suppose following on from, from what you're saying then, for the judiciary, will they have specific training around this, around what this means, around what this, this bill is about? About what the intention of it is and what it, you know what what it is supposed to actually tackle in terms of it's their role. Know, then that's going to be a key thing for the judiciary as well as a range of other organisations. The department, in conjunction with our statutory and voluntary sector partners, will obviously be looking at guidance under the bill. Um, we're having discussions with the judiciary in terms of judicial studies board in relation to um, awareness raising for for the judiciary. As you say, that will be a key element going forward in order to ensure that the, the offence is effectively implemented and that the judiciary have that necessary understanding of, of what um, this looks like. So yes, there, there are discussions in, in relation to that and we want to ensure that you know, a range of partners um, have that awareness in relation to what the abusive, what the abusive behaviour will look like and, and the operation of the new offence when it comes forward. And obviously, I mean, it's, it's not for you to answer, but the PSNA will need similar kind of training in terms of what what this is about and what it's intended to tackle and what abuse actually is, yeah. rather than just someone being physically attacked. may want to, um, to, to touch on that in terms of, kind of the, the, the police side of things. Yes, yeah, certainly um, that's something that we've already commenced work on. I entirely agree. It, it will be appropriate to, to train our officers because it is um, a, a new offence. That's something we've started work on. Um, starting the scenario plan in respect of what sort of type of examples we would be looking at. Um, we've spoke um, at length with the, the department and made clear our position um, in respect of guidance that will, uh, will um, accompany the legislation and the department has committed to, to ensuring that we work together to do that. So certainly uh, at this stage, I'm content that um, we are on track with our interpretation and understanding of it and how we would implement it. Okay, I, th I think that is extremely important because very often in cases where people are actually murdered, 
they have never actually been physically attacked, yeah. but they have been victims of, of ongoing abuse for a long number of years. Okay, thank you, Linda. Rachel? Thank you, Chair. Um, just following on from Linda's point, um, in terms of training in Scotland, there was training for all levels of the judiciary um, after the bill, but also there had been substantial work done in Scotland um, to, in terms of prosecutors in the judiciary and police officers before the bill had actually come in. So in terms of training for judiciary, rather than sort of awareness raising, there would, need, there would definitely need to be training given to all the judiciary at every level, like there was in Scotland, and the same for all police officers at every level before there would be an ability. So I think it, would the department be looking to a wee bit more than awareness raising, but actual training for all levels? I suppose that will ultimately be for the, the judiciary to take forward and determine what that looks like. But yes, certainly we will be keen and will be liaising with um, colleagues in the Office of the Lord Chief Justice as, as well as the Judicial Studies Board in, in terms of what that may look like and, and I suppose as well how we can learn from what has been taken forward in the other jurisdictions but it, as you say it, it will be vital in, in terms of the wide range of organisations that are going to be involved in taking these cases forward that there is that understanding and appreciation of what this new offence entails, what it looks like and, and what they need to be looking out for. Um, in terms of there's been much to talk of the term course of control um, and that has sort of spurred this on um, and a number of the, the in the definition in clause one um, it doesn't actually say course of control and neither does it say that in the explanatory notes I'm wondering if there's a reason for that and also if there's room for that to be put in to the legislation or the explanatory notes I'm aware that it is a term a new term but it is quite well understood what that means, and obviously the legislation will, will need to reflect all various times, or, you know, a, a, an actual time frame. But it is set in this current time, and I think we need to be reflecting a language that people are using, and people generally do understand that term. Um, I wonder then, would we pose the same question to Anthony, would that help in any way in terms of uh, police guidance and definition? Because I'm aware that that has been put into the summary of evidence um, that there isn't a definition, but would the term course of control, if it was in either legislation or explanatory notes, assist in any way? Certainly we can look at, you know, there's, there's no issue with including that in the explanatory notes. That type of terminology around course of control, financial abuse, emotional abuse, parental alienation, that's all, all of those types of things we would want to see reflected in the guidance and giving examples of, of that type of abusive behaviour. I suppose we were keen in terms of the legislation not to use specific phrases or buzzwords, rather I suppose what we wanted to try and ensure, and, and this is, and apologies, it's, it's touching into um, clause two. So what we wanted to do was through clause two and the relevant effects, was set out the behaviours and, and the effects that there would be associated with that, as opposed to having specific terminology or, or phrases, which with development in future years, and, and I suppose the, the most recent one alluded to that is the likes of digital or online abuse. Five, ten years ago, that may not have been a phrase that you would necessarily have had in legislation or, or people would have been um, familiar with. So I suppose what we wanted to try and ensure that we were covering the range of behaviours that would be experienced without explicitly stating in the legislation specific phrases or words, but certainly that's something that we would intend to expand upon in, in terms of the, the guidance documentation, and it's something obviously we'll be working with both our statutory and voluntary sector partners in relation to the content of that guidance and ensuring that, that what they consider as the key issues is covered within that. Okay. Paul Frey. Just are you finished? Sorry, Rachel. Oh, go on oh, ahead. Oh, sorry, Rachel. Rachel. It's all right. Go on ahead. I'll come in after. Uh, just on that point, because Rachel raises a very valid question about the terminology, and of course we have had the concerns shown by not least the Attorney General and the PSNet, SNI at the time about the psychological harm and the phrasing and how that actually is calculated into law. What is wrong with the term coercive control? Because ultimately, to me, psychological harm can happen without a law or even within this context being broken. Uh, you know, something, an event could happen to me that would cause me psychological harm that wouldn't actually be unlawful. Whereas coercive control speaks far more to the point where an individual has been coerced or bullied into an action or an inaction and being controlled because of it. Yeah. To me, to me, you lose something by not adding the term coercive control. 
uh, alongside psychological harm because it just hits more buttons in a, in an unlawful sense, which this bill is designed to do. No, I certainly appreciate where you're coming from, Paul, in relation to that. I suppose in, in terms of, again, the relevant effects aspect in um, Clause 2, you know, we consider that would come within a number of the, the ambits of, of it. There's obviously reference made to controlling behaviour um, within that. As they say, what we were keen to try and do was ensure that the types of behaviours were covered, but that we didn't end up having a specific list for which offenders in, in future, you know, because new things will materialise and emerge over, over time. What we don't want to happen is that people say, well, it's not listed within the legislation here in terms of it being course of control or online abuse or digital abuse or, or whatever may come about in, in future years that we're not currently experiencing. I suppose we, we didn't want um, you know, there, there to be that gap potentially if we were to use specific terminology within the legislation itself. Rather, what we wanted to try and ensure was, in terms of course of control, parental alienation, economic abuse, financial abuse, emotional abuse, are those covered by the effects and the behaviours that we have within the legislation? But, but do you not think and feel that coercive control is actually an umbrella term and not a specific term? Well, it, it, it will obviously cover a, a wide range of behaviours that mm -hmm. could be encapsulated um, within that, and, and certainly in terms of the guidance that will be associated with the bill, you know, that will be very clearly terminology that we will want to include within that. We'll also want to make reference to parental alienation, to emotional abuse, all of those types of phrases. But again, what we would want to be bringing it back to is the behavior, that broader range of behaviours that is, is set out within the bill, in which we would be of the view, you know, sufficiently covers course of control, parental alienation, um, those other types of of, of phrases that, that may make reference to specific abusive behaviour. But I do appreciate where you're coming from in, in terms of that terminology, and I think that will be particularly important in terms of the guidance and, I suppose, common parlance um, that is used in, in relation to the offence going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, Rachel. OK. Um, just uh, Paul touched on it there with the, the differences with the Westminster Bill. Um, I was just wondering if you could give me a sort of a, a, a bit of a reasoning in terms of why a condition of age of the offence wasn't put in, you know, 16 or over like it is in Westminster. Um, it's just sort of, it seems to leave children open to prosecution as well as being treated as victims. So they can be both victims and perpetrators within this bill and then any form of, uh, any, why 16 and why, why is it open-ended? In terms of the position in England and Wales, our offence does apply to under 16, so it's the same as ourselves in terms of its age of criminal responsibility and over, albeit that in terms of their domestic abuse definition, which they have brought forward through their most recent legislation, that has an age threshold of 16. Um, you know, so it, it could be argued, I suppose, that there's something of an anomaly there, but in terms of their, um, their equivalent offence, which is dealt with in the 2015 um, legislation that they brought forward, it does apply to those. So essentially you could have an offender aged 10 and over um, with the England and Wales offence and you also could have a, a victim who's under the age of 16. Um, that's something that we'd, we'd liaise with our, our colleagues in Home Office on. Okay, and it just, that, that's, that, that was, that's the reason why there was no condition of age put in into ours, just because it wouldn't be matching up then with the... I suppose not necessarily to match up with England and Wales, albeit that that we, we do match in that respect. I suppose we were keen to try and ensure that we could cover abuse of elderly parents, grandparents, etc., by younger family members. Also, we wanted to ensure that we could um, capture, and I suppose take into account of the fact that you can have people who are relatively young but have been in abusive relationships for a number of years. You know, so you should you could have somebody of 15, 16 who has been in abusive relationships with individuals for a number of years prior to that. Um, I suppose what is important and what we would caveat that with is that obviously any decision will depend on the particular individual circumstances of the case. Um, certainly in England and Wales, our understanding is, and in the other jurisdictions, there <coughs> have been relatively few prosecutions taken forward in relation to those that are under the age of 18. You know, that will be dependent on the circumstances. There will be consideration given to whether or not it's in the public interest to take that case forward, and also consideration given as to whether or not there are alternative disposals that should be looked at instead of, of the domestic abuse offence. But as I say, we say, were, we were keen to ensure that, that we could deal with those scenarios, but our sense is that probably similar to the other jurisdictions, I think it's probably likely that the number of cases that are taken forward for those that are 
of that, that young age are probably likely to be relatively small. And again, as they say, dependent on the, the particular circumstances of the case. Okay, thank you. And finally, just in terms of the um, Scottish legislation has been highlighted, the, you know, the gold standard. And our bill is largely modelled on the legislation that Scotland had implemented. But with a very stark difference at the very start is that Scottish legislation is on a partner or ex-partner, whereas ours is vastly Either. different than that, um, which opens us up to a number of different issues stemming from that. And you know, what domestic abuse isn't um, in, in different clauses in the bill, and we can get on to that. But if we haven't specified the offence as a course of behaviour that's abusive solely on a personal relationship or an intimate personal relationship. But why is that? Where did that come from? Was it through the task and finish groups? Was that sort so of that's in terms of the coverage of family yeah. members, essentially? It, just, it, it widens it out, obviously, past domestic abuse, which is you know, in an in intimate personal relationship, basically a couple or ex-couple. Um, and then everything else in our bill then will stem from that, the reasonable defence and uh, all of the other, uh, where, where domestic abuse isn't, you know, in parental responsibility, what it's not, and, and so on. So, yes, we have largely modelled our legislation on Scotland, but their definition is so vastly different. Yeah. So, I would just like to delve into that, why that is, where did that come from? Obviously, it wasn't part of the, this legislation a number of years ago. So, um, where did that come from? The sector organisations? Essentially, I suppose, at, at its core, it's reflecting what's in um, the seven-year domestic and sexual abuse strategy. So, essentially, within the scope of it, um, domestic abuse is deemed to cover both intimate relationships and also family members. It also covers the approach that will be taken by placing in terms of kind of the, the scope of that, that currently. So that really was the, the genesis of, of that coverage and why we're different from um, Scotland in, in that regard. Um, so as I say, it's you know underpinning that is, is a seven year strategy and what the, the scope of it is. Again, we were, were keen to ensure that the domestic abuse offence reflected what was in that strategy. To have done otherwise would have left the two vastly different. And we will pick up on that in clause five, members. Is there anything more on Clause 1 that members want to pick up on? Um, can I take you then to Clause 2? Um, okay, in terms of what amounts to abusive behaviour. Paul Frew. Yes, thank you, Chair. So, I've been str obviously, this is domestic abuse and court proceedings. Bill, and I've been struggling, I suppose, over the last number of months to try and put down in words how we could protect people who are involved in um, family court contact orders, uh, parents seeking uh, uh, access to children and children seeking access to parents, and how that can be used as an arm of abuse. And we've seen it very clearly, and it's very, very hard to get that down. I'm struggling. I'm not a bill uh, officer, of course. I don't, I'm not a legislator in that regard either. So. So how, how can you assure us in this committee that the like of that where someone, a parent, abuses, um, intentionally breaches family contact orders, which causes havoc to the other parent and to the children, I would suggest, with regards not turning up, going to a wrong place, putting the blame on the other parent for not uh, being there whenever it wasn't meant to be there in the first place, all of that. It gets really messy and horrific. How can we get that down onto paper and this bill to help and assist those parents who suffer in this way? I suppose ultimately in terms of the bill as it stands at the moment, um, in, in terms of those specific types of circumstances, it would be looking at it in the context of is that deemed to be abusive behaviour, does it fall within the, the scope of the offence, can it be taken forward and, and is there the necessary evidence in, in relation to that? Jane, I'm not sure if there's anything that you want to add in, in terms of the, the contact side of things. Uh, well, I suppose just to note uh, that there is, um, you, you were talking there about um, a parent potentially bringing proceedings and that in itself being, yes. being abusive. Um, and there is a power in the children order whereby um, a court can um, order that further proceedings can't be brought without the leave of, of the court. Mm -hmm. So th there are some remedies, I suppose, yeah. already there in the um, family 
legislation um, and you also referred there to intentional breaches of, of contact orders and so on. Obviously, um, there are powers for the court to deal with enforcement of, of contact orders and breaches of contact orders. Um, but which I seems know to take some, some concerns which, around that. Which but, adds a process. So, so yes, the, there is a court proceeding arm of abuse whereby I'll take you to court and we'll go through the process again. But when we actually get to the point where we've finished with court and now we've got a settlement in place where there's contact arrangements and then those contact arrangements are breached, if the only, and I know uh, this is hard and this is why I'm struggling with it, the, the only remedy is to go to court again to get something enforced. Um, and that in itself is just a rigmarole for a parent, uh, maybe who uh, you know, are having to pay. So, so how can we assure, so it, it may be a better remedy that the, parent, the aggrieved parent can then use this legislation and say, look, you're abusing me here and, and be able to then take, go to the police and then get this enforced. It becomes a different part of the law. Yes, it's an alternative. Yes, yes. So, so, and that to me could, could be used then to, to use by the aggrieved parent to try and resolve the issue. Even the threat, I suppose, of being able to use this legislation, as opposed to going through the family court process, would be much more powerful. Uh, and ultimately, so that will come it? back to you know that point of is this deemed to be abusive behaviour? Would a reasonable person consider that to be abusive behaviour, given all of the information that's at hand? But but certainly, if it was deemed to meet the necessary criteria within the legislation, there is the potential that the domestic abuse offence could be used for for that purpose. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Linda. It's just to pick up on Paul's point, just quickly. I suppose no matter what we put down on paper here, people are going to abuse it because even what you're saying there, where contact is is not being carried out as it as it has been ordered, sometimes that's because the parent who has the child is very fearful and thinks the judge has made a wrong call. So I suppose just in terms of saying even the threat of having this because bad people. <laughs> will use that as a threat and to continue to abuse. So I don't think we can make, unfortunately, perfect legislation because we're dealing with human beings that will always try to manipulate it to, to serve their own purpose. So I, I, I probably I have concerns from both sides in relation to that particular point. It's just to make that point. No. Uh, response. Have you have you looked at the the number of prosecutions that could be being taken forward uh, if this legislation comes into being in this clause? In terms of the abuse offence more generally, our yeah. sense is that there probably won't be a significant increase in new prosecutions. Um, you know, our view is that you will have a number of cases that are currently being taken forward, so for example criminal damage, assault, etc, etc. They will move from being taken forward as those types of provisions and come in under the auspices of the, the domestic abuse offence and will potentially encapsulate what would have been previously a number of separate charges. Um, the indication that we've given in the expanded and financial memorandum is that we envisage and, and albeit, you know, we we'll, we'll need to see what happens in, in practice, but envisage that there could be an increase of around 3% over and above the cases that are currently going through the system but as I say our sense is that a lot of current cases will move from those separate individual charges and rather be brought forward under the, the new offence so a lot of them will already be in the system as opposed to envisaging that there's a, a significant increase in, in new offences as such. Okay and it just touches I suppose on the points members have made for, for this clause around parental alienation that that's covered as to, to what will be defined as this type of behaviour, is parental alienation going to be included as, a, as an offence? Certainly our, our view would be, and, and again it will obviously in, in any case will be dependent on the individual circumstances of the case, um, you know, we would be of the view that parental alienation could potentially come within the auspices of the domestic abuse offence um, in terms of the relevant effects that have been set out within the bill. And will that be in your guidance? Certainly not something that we can reference in, in the guidance and, and again give examples of the types of behaviour and, and what we envisage coming within that. Okay, because that, that would tie in with the intentional breaking of family contact orders and so on that mm. you know, we hear in, in a lot of individuals that's coming forward. Spiritual abuse has been raised in some of the evidence sessions. Is that covered in this clause? Again, I suppose in, in terms of um, spiritual abuse, parental alienation, <coughs> all of those those types of, I suppose, newer 
um, terminologies, for, for want of a better phrase, it will ultimately come. It will ultimately depend on the individual circumstances of the case. But if it is deemed to be, you know, isolating individuals, controlling them, regulating their behaviour, checks on them, restricting what they can do, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know, if it if it is if it meets the effects in the bill, mm. um, is two or more occasions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, you know, it will potentially be covered by the domestic abuse offence. As I say, it will be very much in, in any of those cases, and, and in any case more generally, um, be dependent on the particular circumstances of the case. But, but certainly, we would be of the view that there is the potential for that type of behaviour to become within the, the scope of the offence. What, what, what does that behaviour look like whenever, whenever we talk about spiritual abuse? What I does suppose that cover? You, you're going to be coming back to. Um, the effects that are in the bill, what is deemed to be abusive behaviour. Is that individual being restricted, limited, controlled, coerced? Um, you know, if those types of things are present, um, you know, that then potentially would come within the auspices of the domestic abuse So offense. a child wants to engage in some kind of spiritual activity. Let's not define what it is. But mum, dad, guardian says, no, absolutely not. I'm not letting you do that. And that is repeated on more than one occasion. Can that child take the guardian parent, potentially put a case in to say, I'm suffering abuse because I'm not being allowed to, to do this. express my spiritual beliefs? In a child parent scenario, and, and I don't mean this to appear unhelpful, that obviously wouldn't come within the scope of the, the offence as currently drafted because there is that exclusion. But if you had two individuals... So a partner, someone, yeah. the normal relationship something happens to someone they convert yeah. for example and that's something very much frowned upon in that relationship partner x says to partner y you're not allowed to to engage in that spiritual belief again it will come down to uh, is it deemed to be abusive behavior has it happened on two or more occasions is it covering the types of effects that are in um the the legislation it will very much depend on um, the nature of how that plays out in practice, um, but depending on, on, on how that is and on how extreme or, or impactful it is on the individual, it could potentially come within it. Okay. Okay, members. Uh, Nelson, clause two. Okay, clause three. Um, so this, this takes us to the issue about Jim Allister has raised this around where no harm has taken place. Do you want to just comment then on that around? He highlights um, Scotland in terms of the data. So I think the Minister and others have held up the Scottish model in this respect, and he got information to indicate that there's been no prosecutions in Scotland around where no actual harm was caused. Do you want to just touch on that for us? Yes, certainly in, in terms of the information that have came that has come from Scottish colleagues and it's something that we have um, discussed with them as as the, the data has indicated there hasn't been any um, prosecutions taken forward on that basis. In terms of the, the clause itself, the provision on, on what we wanted the bill to do, and, and I suppose again going back to the, the Luke and Ryan Hart scenario, what we wanted to try and ensure was that potentially or there is the ability for cases to be taken forward where harm, an individual may not necessarily um, be of the view that harm has been caused to them, but a reasonable person looking at the particular information to hand in those specific circumstances would be of the view that harm could be caused to an individual and would be deemed to be um, abusive behaviour. So that's the thinking behind that, that provision. So the scenario I'm trying to picture, someone you know, can clearly want to cause harm, has that thought process made and, and then may even go about planning all of it but doesn't actually carry it through, albeit there's evidence then you know, that they were in preparation for it. It's the thought of, you know, so I think the example that he gave in the, in the chamber was, you know, I may look at someone who I really dislike and you know, ha have a, a thought of ill intent, is that being captured by the bill? You know, will someone then put in a complaint to say, you know, Mr X thinks this about me? And in that scenario, ultimately, again, it will come back. Everything, I suppose, will come back to clause one in the sense of, is it deemed to be abusive behaviour and have there been two or more occasions? 
and if it doesn't fall into that criteria in the first instance. So, um, you know, people and, and some of the examples that were given in, in terms of the evidence is where you have individuals who have fallen out, um, you know, where they may not be treating someone the way that they should be treating um, that other person. That won't be captured within the offence in the sense of it has to be deemed to be abusive behaviour, a reasonable person has to consider that, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I suppose in, in terms of the way in which the offence has been crafted, you know, we've um, intentionally tried to ensure that there's a number of checks and balances in there in, in relation to this so that you don't get um, those types of incidents captured um, within the new domestic abuse offence. Also, there'd be the case of PPS's consideration in relation to those charges being brought forward or potential prosecution in terms of is it in the public interest given the information that's at hand to take this case forward you know and, and the, the view would be that in in that type of scenario it wouldn't be in the public interest and the conditions for the the abuse offence wouldn't have been met hmm. so by the time you get to the PPS considering is it in the public interest someone's already been charged investigated file prepared um, and as it's a, appeared on a number of occasions, you know, that ultimately the police need to consider these things. PPS need to identify if criteria has been met. You know, and I can raise it in the context of some of the other clauses about being careful that we're not just putting something in legislation that is symbolic. Um, no, and as you say, obviously PPS is coming in at a much later stage. You know, this will also be an issue for consideration by police in, in terms of, again, have the conditions of the, the offence been met? Is there deemed to be abusive behaviour? You know, have there been the two or more occasions? <coughs> All of that there would obviously have kicked in at the, the police stage before it would get to the point at which PPS are taking the decision around a public interest test. Rachel. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the reasonableness person is so crucial to this, obviously in a different clause, but um, there are examples of victimless prosecutions in England, Wales and Scotland, um, and especially based on victims who no longer want to press charges or pursue cases within the court system. So I'm wondering if there's been any lessons learned from those cases in other jurisdictions, if there's been any discussions with Scotland on, on their legislation so far, and if there's any learning to be had. You know, but is there, is there a problem is there maybe there isn't any victimless crimes? I, I highly doubt that. But is there is there a problem with the evidence gathering? Is there a problem with the prosecution? Where's the sticking points in getting prosecutions underneath clause three? Um, I think it's very important that it, it's in there um, alongside the, the reasonable the reasonable person test. Um, but it's just if there's been any communication with Scotland on on theirs. Exactly. I suppose we've we've had general discussions with Scotland in terms of how their offence has has went generally. Um, their offence is obviously in place for a, a much shorter period than England and Wales, but certainly the indication that we got from them is that the offence is working well. There don't appear to be any major or substantial hurdles in in terms of cases being brought forward, and certainly the indication in terms of the. Um, data and figures that was available for the first year, albeit that I don't think that this was formalised stats as, as such. The indication was that the number of cases that they were getting being brought forward was much higher than what had been experienced by England and Wales at the same point um, in terms of their process. So certainly the, the figures and the indications from Scotland bode well in relation to that and, and aren't giving us, in terms of the discussions that we've had with them, any significant cause for concern in relation to the, the construct of the offence and, and how it's working in practice. Um, Sinead Bradley. Oh, on Sorry, me. one second. Sinead will just bring you into the speaker system. Okay. Can you hear me now, Chair? Thank you, Sinead. Thank you. Um, Chair, just on that uh, clause, I understand that there were, I, I'm thinking in the lines of a vulnerable person who may not know harm is being done to them. Um, and this would be a clause that would very much protect them. But I see in there there's the requirement for the public interest test to be met. And with the obviously difficulties um, in collecting evidence in that case in particular, um, I'd just be curious to know further, the public interest test, if it was, for example, an individual, how, how would that test run? Or what, how does that operate? 
suppose that's a common aspect of all offences and charges that are brought back. You know, it's a it's a standard piece of the way in which PPS operate. Um, you know, so they will look at whether or not it's in the public interest for charges to be brought forward, given the particular circumstances in in the case. I don't have information in, in terms of how that operates more generally in, in terms of what portion um, of cases and charges being brought forward by PPS. They may not take cases forward in relation to the public interest, um, but certainly it's a, it's a, a standard part of their decision-making process and you know, they, they will be well-versed in how that operates. Thank you, Chair. Does the Westminster model include this clause? Um, clause three, I think they have, I can't remember what the, the wording of their phrase is. It's obviously um, different from, from this, but there is something um, akin to that in terms of their provision. That certainly I can check that mm -hmm. out and we can come back to the committee in relation to that Sh query. Sinead's point is, is well made for, for someone who, who doesn't know or, or, or doesn't understand the, the treatment that they're being subjected to um, is coercive and, and relates to domestic abuse. Um, but it's that issue that R Rachel raises about would a reasonable person regard the actions to, to be one that may lead to being frightened, humiliated, degraded, um, punished or intimidated? Um, Yeah, it's just a difficult one to, to try and, if, if no actual harm has been caused, the person doesn't believe that they've been harmed, but it'll be for a reasonable person to decide if... Well, I suppose in, in relation to that, and again, I would, I would cite the example of the Hart brothers. You know, I think it's, it's a person having access to the information in relation to that case. For a number of these incidents, there will be, or a number of these cases, there will obviously have been multiple incidents mm -hmm. behind that. And I suppose it's looking at all of that information in the round and, and saying, you know, almost in, in some respects, setting aside what the individual may, may view in, in terms of what has happened. Would somebody looking at that information have an access to the same information, deem this to be abusive behaviour and that that individual was being, for example, coercively controlled or financially abused or... Um, you know what, what the behaviour might look like. Okay. Can I also add to that, Chair? So, a victim will modify their behaviour so that they don't become harmed, either by threat uh, or threat of a child. So they'll do something or act out or modify their behaviour so that they don't fall in the arms way, so that he won't or she won't hit me or take something off me or take away allowances. So. I think that has to be factored in. Also, the person's mode of behaviour, a reasonable person should look on that and say, well, that's not a reasonable mode of behaviour, so because you're doing that, because of the threat implied, uh, I think that's a very key factor in the whole coercive control piece. And I think we need to retain that, that power, if you like. And again, you'll want to, as you say, Paul, you'll want to look at all of, all of that information in the round in, in terms of how... You know those two inter individuals are interacting what the behavior is between the two of them how either of them may be adjusting their behavior and and does what what is happening you know is that reasonable or could it be deemed to be abusive behavior given all of that chair if i if i may add in support of that having thought about it from a, an operational perspective and particularly around the vulnerability where i was considering there may be some opportunities for example third party information you know so if there's a vulnerable person who may not be able to give that prima facie evidence themselves if there's another family member, a neighbour, a witness who could provide that information, I felt that this clause would be particularly supportive um, in those circumstances. What I would say, and it goes back to the point you made yourself a few minutes ago, uh, these are the types of issues for me that the task and finish group really do need to get into the nuts and bolts of. And that's not just from a policing perspective, but across the PPS and potentially into the judiciary so that we're lined up on this. Because what none of us want is we start to try to take prosecutions forward and they fail because we have a difference of opinion so I'd be really keen that we look to try to have some clear examples of these very things but I do think there is a there is a strong sense for me that this clause could be used to, to good effect. Chair, can I just add to that actually the more conversation we have around this clause you actually realise that 
plus three goes to the very heart of what this bill is about. It is about those who actually the, the behaviour has become so normalised, mm -hmm. and because nobody has physically attacked them, yeah, yeah. that they think that they're not being abused. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's become normalised to them, and whilst we might look on and think, but well, I, I wouldn't tolerate that, or I wouldn't put up with that, you know, being told what to do. Society thinks it's normal too, whilst I wouldn't put up with it. If they're happy enough, that's OK. Mm -hmm. It's not. I think Linda, and, and we all that, need to that get really there. is at the crux of it, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, it is those scenarios where this behaviour has been on for years upon years. This is, you know, this is normal for those individuals, but we as outsiders having access to the same information, how they're being treated, what their life is like, how they're being controlled, etc., etc., can very obviously see that there's domestic abuse, that it is abusive behaviour and that it's wrong. Um, but for those individuals in that situation, it has effectively become normalised. And if they were to be asked, are you suffering from domestic abuse? There is every chance that they would say, no, I'm not. And, and again, and, and not wanting to hark back to the same example, but that was exactly what occurred in relation to the, the Hart brothers. That had been going on for years upon years. They were um, isolated from family and friends. They were moved to a remote location. They didn't have access to um, that support network. From their perspective, they knew that something wasn't right. They knew that their father was, you know, he was strict, etc., mm -hmm. etc., et but had no appreciation until after um, the death of those two family members that that is what they had been suffering from. And, and this is actually already used in terms of, if you look at even social services cases, where they would deem a, a parent to be a vulnerable parent who is under the influence of another parent who is potentially a danger to them and the child, they will put in place measures to protect the child, even though the vulnerable parent may not acknowledge that they're in any danger or even that the child is in any danger. So so it's it's already you know it's already happening, it's just not in, in legislation. But in some respects if you don't have that provision, it's those type of cases we actually won't be able to deal with because it will simply be stated there, what, the individual does not consider that harm was caused. They do not consider that they were subject to domestic abuse, and those it won't be possible to take those cases forward. Which, for many of the cases that are, are obviously we're unable to progress and and um, have people convicted for at the moment. Okay, okay. Thank you. Clause four. Um, around the meaning of behaviour, and I, I just want to get. You have clarified it in, the, in the, the written evidence. There had been an issue raised by the Evangelical Alliance in respect to who the youth leader, young person, faith context, mentoring, and, and so on. And you've identified where the offence relates to two people personally connected, <coughs> um, partners, family members, intimate relationships, and generally speaking, in an uh, this would not be the case in an organisational capacity where other safeguarding provisions would apply. So it's just, I know that was an issue that has been raised by others about how expansive is it in terms yeah. of that connection. And, and, and obviously that's not the type of thing you would want to be encapsulating within a domestic abuse offence. You know, we clearly want to be um, staying out of that type of territory. Yeah. Okay. Is there any questions, members, on Clause 4? Okay, Clause 5. Just a question uh, in terms of the department being satisfied um, that the legislation is currently drafted wouldn't have the unintended consequences and potentially criminalise family disagreements that aren't within the scope of this bill or within this offence. No, and, and, and certainly, you know, I, again, I suppose coming back to the, the construct of of the offence, the checks and balances that is within it. Um, and, and the crux of what the offence is about in, in terms of is it abusive behaviour, has to be two or more occasions, would a reasonable person with the same information be of a, a similar view? You know, it, it's certainly not intended um, uh, and, and we don't think would, would come within the scope of the offence in, in terms of, as you said, those normal family disagreements, for want of a better phrase. Okay, Rachel. Thank you, Chair. Um, just very quickly, in terms of the personal connection because the definition is wide, is there a number of, of personal connections that are, are outlined here? Um, and family, family relationships by way of marriage and stepchildren, they're all covered there. But 
There's no specific reference to fostering or kinship arrangements. Is, that, is there any particular reason why? We've had to, on, on foot of some of the, the issues that were raised during the, the sessions, we've had discussions with um, Departmental Solicitor's Office in relation to that, um, and are off the few, um, in, in terms of what we deem to be family, it would cover those types of scenarios, but then obviously your parental exclusion would kick in in relation to that, but they are off the view, you know, adoptions, um, uh, caring scenarios, etc., would come within um, the scope of, of that parental responsibility, but then, as I say, the parental exclusion um, provision would, would apply in, in relation to that. Okay. Someone else in five. Um, six is straightforward, unless any members have a question on six. Seven, in terms of the serving of notices, um, would there be any occasions where that could be individuals rather than legal representatives? Um, and if so, are the issues highlighted by women's aid in relation to sending the notice by post relevant in those circumstances? And that's something I suppose we we try to get some clarification from um, in in relation to this. Our understanding is that the concerns in relation to that are largely around the likes of non molestation orders, etc., where there are difficulties in, in terms of notices being received or, or an individual being aware of, of where those are at in the process. Um, in terms of these notices, they are very much in, in terms of kind of the, the proceedings and, and around whether or not there is a, a personal connection between individuals. So the notices will be served either on the the person who is charged in the proceedings or their solicitor. So it's essentially um, notices being um, provided between, by and large, legal parties. Um, so appreciate the concerns that have been raised by Women's Aid in, in relation to wider protection orders and um, that type of thing, but we don't consider that it's an issue in relation to this particular clause, given that it's quite tightly restricted in terms of the, the notices that it's applying to. Okay. Okay, members, clause eight, <coughs> aggravation where the victim's under 18. Um, just a general point, I suppose, um, around how the Gillen Review of Family Justice completed in 2017, <coughs> and it's about progress to address the contact orders, child arrangements, which are issues that, ha that have been highlighted by a number of the individuals and organisations that we've heard from in the context of domestic abuse and legislation. A time scale? Is there one for progress in that area? And a few on the Gillen Review. Yeah. I think, um, as, as um, members will be aware, there there are a large number of recommendations in the Gillen Review and Family Justice, and, and of course not all of those are for the department. Um, many for other departments with responsibilities uh, for family justice, um, for the judiciary, for, for the legal profession. Um, but in terms of those recommendations that are for for the the department, those are being actively um, considered and, and progress in a, in a number of areas. For example, the prohibition on cross-examination in, in person was a specific recommendation of uh, the Gillen Review, and I know there's uh, work being taken forward um, in one of the other divisions to, to together with the Department of Health, to um, better support parents who are who are separating to um, help parents. Uh, develop a better relationship uh, both with each other and um, to understand the needs of their child as they're separating, I suppose, to try and intervene early to prevent acrimony and, and negative behaviours arising in the first <coughs> place. Um, I mean, some of the, the recommendations are, are quite su substantial um, and do, do require some, some detailed uh, consideration, but certainly that, that work is ongoing. Okay, it'd be helpful just to get but more detail around that aspect of contact orders, child arrangements, um, for Richard, reference you mean the in our report. Judicial practice directions specifically, or well, the area that we're looking at around the clause eight um, is touched upon within the Gillen review and recommendations around it. So it's in that general sense. It would be helpful because it'll be raised by other members. I'm not looking to change Clause 8, but it's just some of the points raised touch on the Gillen Review. So as we complete our report, it'll be helpful to cite here's the Department's implementation of this aspect of the Gillen Review, which will tie into some of the evidence that we've heard around this. Okay, Clause 9, um, 
Just one question. Um, clarity as to whether Clause 9 would apply in a situation where a child does not directly witness the abuse? Um, you could have a situation where the child is used um, to abuse another individual, um, and then in terms of 9.2b, so the child saw, heard, or was present. So they, they could potentially be in another room in the, in the house. They, they could be in a, in a bedroom um, where the abuse is taking um, part in the living room. So potentially there is scope for, for that to be covered. Okay, anyone? Rachel. Thank you. Just to clarify on that one, then, um, the, if if it is, is it covered then? If if the child must, because it, it says the child must have heard, saw, or been present during an incident of abuse, but the Scottish approach is different, where it says that you know, they don't have to be present, saw, or or heard. So we're just wondering why there's a difference between Scotland and here if it's for the same end. From recollection, and I don't have the Scottish provision. Um, with me, our provision is, is the same as theirs in, in terms of that aspect. I, it's something I'll certainly come back, I can check out and come back to the, the committee in relation to that. I know there are some slight variations in, in terms of the approach that we've taken for um, the aggravation in relation to that. So, for example, the child doesn't necessarily have to be the child of the individuals that are involved, where it's, it's say, a mother and father. It doesn't necessarily have to um, be their child. Um, but I, I, I certainly will, will look at that and come, come back to the committee in relation to that. And I suppose just, Anthony, how, in an operational matter, how would, that, how would you gather evidence of that? In respect of if a... If, if you've got um, an aggravation through a child, you know, sort of seeing, hearing or is present, whose evidence would you be relying on for that child to be present, heard, or sit, you know, would it be the yeah. child's evidence, are you, or, or would you... My, my interpretation of that is not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, it, it could be that if an adult says that a child was present, you know, the child, for example, may be asleep. Um, in that circumstance, it would be appropriate to record that information from the victim or another person present, right. and that therefore would lead to using that as, as evidence. But of course, if it was appropriate to, to speak to a child, because we are aware that quite often, you know, um, there is a reflection that we don't. Um, listen enough to the voice of children in a domestic incident, and that certainly is something that I believe would, would, would allow us to do both, focus the minds of doing so when it was appropriate to do so, but also given us sufficient um, scope that if the child, for example, was asleep, we could still proceed. Absolutely. Thank you. Sorry, the only other thing I suppose to um, point out in relation to where we're different from Scotland, from what I can recall, um, they have provision that a reasonable person would consider that harm has been caused to the child. We deliberately didn't include that because we were of the view the fact that a child is in the property is witnessing that abuse in and of itself is sufficient for um, the offence to be aggravated. So that's one other element um, whereby we, we differ slightly from Scotland in relation to the scope of that provision. Okay. Clause 10, members. We have discussed at length now in terms of that, the issue around behaviour occurring outside the UK. So members have had legal opinion and, and all of that. So I have no more questions around Clause 10. Members are content. Um, clause 11. One question. What further developments have there been in discussions with the Department of Health um, on a possible amendment to child protection provisions that would be included in this bill and when would we be in a position to confirm if an amendment is being brought forward? Well, as we've indicated, we've had discussions with health in relation to that. We've obviously taken account of the comments and concerns that were expressed as part of the um, committee's evidence gathering stage and in order to, you know, I suppose that, that amendment is intended to try and um, address the issue that in, in relation to child protection provisions at the moment there is explicit reference to um, physical abuse of individuals. I think the, the position in, in terms of England and Wales was that it was considered that the provision covered non-physical abuse, um, but we thought it would be helpful to make a change in relation to that in uh, terms of making that explicit within their, their child protection um, legislation. So obviously we will want to have discussions with them in terms of what uh, the nature of that amendment may look like, um, but our sense at this stage is that it's it's likely to be a relatively straightforward amendment, um, which which will make reference to non-physical abuse within those child protection 
um, measures and, and hopefully will serve to allay some of the concerns that have been expressed by um, members and, and also respondents to the, the committee evidence sessions. Okay. It will be helpful for us that we get that sooner rather than later. You know, otherwise, we will not be able to give a committee position on it. So, um, if you can expedite that with colleagues in health, that would be appreciated, and then we can consider it. Um, clause 12, um, defence on grounds of reasonableness. Um, this is obviously one of the clauses that attracted most interest, probably in terms of the, the provisions of the bill. One of the things that we were discussing this morning, and I've had discussions with PPS in relation to, which I, I perhaps didn't make as explicit in the, um, the table coming back to the committee as well, and, and obviously appreciate where, where concerns are coming from in relation to this. In terms of the defence provision, as, as well as the information that we've set out, in, in terms of the response, the fact that evidence has to be provided, um, you know, that would have to be considered as, as part of the, the provisions going forward, I suppose, by way of some reassurance in terms of the defence, given that the domestic abuse offence will be a course of behaviour. So, for example, if you have 10 incidents that are comprising that domestic abuse offence, it won't be sufficient that an individual says for one or two of those occasions um, that they have a, a defence in relation to the behaviour. Each of those incidents would have to be looked at. So, for example, if you had 10 incidents comprising the domestic abuse offence, um, they would have to give evidence in relation to nine of those ten incidents that their behaviour has been um, reasonable in relation to that. There's evidence provided of that um, in order for the domestic abuse offence um, not to apply. So just in, in case that's helpful in, in terms of kind of the, the, the committee's deliberations and, and their considerations, it wouldn't be sufficient to say for one or two of those. Here is my defence and, and here is the evidence of that. It, it would obviously have to be provided in relation to the majority of the, the incidents that were making up the domestic abuse offence in order for that to be knocked out for want of a better phrase. Mm. Um, if, if clause 12 wasn't in the bill, what effect would that have then on the, the bill? I suppose the purpose of Clause 12 is, is really to provide that balance and calibration. You know, obviously, the, the focus of all of this is very much driven about the need to ensure that victims um, are protected, that um, there is, is the necessary access through the, the criminal justice system. The, the clause is intended very much to ensure in those scenarios where, given the particular um, circumstances of that case, an individual's um, behaviour at the outset may look as if or would be deemed to be abusive, but when you consider the particular circumstances of that case, it isn't because there is good reason for that behaviour having been undertaken. Um, so it's to ensure ultimately that you don't get individuals being charged with a domestic abuse offence where, given all of the circumstances of the case, um, you know, there is a rationale and a reason for that particular behaviour. Some of the examples cited someone in the home engages in self-harm and another individual restrains them on potentially multiple occasions. That would be a reasonable defence, I think, for most reasonable people. Yeah. Or someone had a gambling addiction and someone was trying to prevent them from accessing funds and, and, and all of that. That is very, you know, it's, it's those types of scenarios that the clause is very much um, focused on, on, on trying to deal with. And as you say, you know, the offence more generally as well as the defence, you know, we, we have tried to very much have an approach of checks and balances within that, but it is to ensure that ultimately somebody isn't convicted of domestic abuse where, as you say, given the particular circumstances of the case, there is a reason as to why that behaviour has been carried out. And they would have to, because it's a course of behaviour, provide that defence essentially for almost all of those incidents. It wouldn't be a case of, of citing it for one occasion for our right. argument's sake. Paul? Yeah, so it strikes me that if we're using a reasonable person for a lot of these clauses that we've already discussed, and then we ignore a reasonable person, clause 12, for a defence, I think you lose balance. Um, and I, I do think, for some of the examples that have been cited here over the immediate minute, that we, we need to ensure that we don't make the job of parenting uh, and also the guardianship of loved ones even harder or preventative and and so in that regard I'm I seem to be and again not this is not a complete picture yet for me but I'm tending to be um, 
content with the defence on grounds of reasonableness, because ultimately, if, if anyone has to be accountable in, in court and the barrister is defending that person, of course that defence is going to have to be reasonable, or else it just won't yeah. succeed. Uh, so, to me, th this is a fundamental issue about process of law and somebody having a def being able to present a defence. And there, there are occasions which have been cited here even today that, where you can see how parenting isn't easy and looking after someone isn't easy. And we need to ensure that there is that reasonable clause that we don't make life harder for people in a caring role. Uh, and that's what I look at. I, I can see why organisations are distraught with this and, and want to and see it removed. We do fully appreciate those concerns and why yeah. people have those concerns. Because because people want to see results for so long, they've been left without yeah. bereft of decent legislation around this uh, this crime, and they want to see results. But I just worry that to remove this will remove balance. The other thing I suppose by by way of, of information is that we've had discussions with colleagues in both Home Office and Scotland in relation to this um, issue to see what their experience is and, and obviously in, in those jurisdictions there there is a, a clause that is, is fairly similar to the clause 12, you know, they are, are not aware of significant issues in, in relation to this clause and, um, you know, so I, I think from our perspective that provided some reassurance that it does appear to be um, working the way it should work. Um, in the other jurisdictions, but, but do fully appreciate why organisations have concerns and where they're coming from in, in relation to that. Thank you. Rachel. Thank you. Um, in terms of, just for another example, how has this been looked at in terms of for addiction? Um, you've got a partner who you are removing finance from because they have an addiction to drugs or alcohol and your, their addiction is caused by your behaviour as a perpetrator of domestic abuse in the home. Mm -hmm. or can we open up with clause 12 to say, well, that, that behaviour is okay because you're doing that. Is that it, does that meet the reasonable person test? I suppose with... With any of the, the provisions of the clause, it is going to be very much dependent on the particular circumstances of the case and, and the information um, that isn't at hand. The, the clause is intended to try and ensure that individuals, um, you know, behaviour that may be carried out in order to protect or uh, assist someone, um, that they aren't criminalised in relation to that. In, in terms of those instances where um, abusive behaviour there is abusive behaviour towards an individual and that is giving rise to some other symptoms or problems. That obviously would need to be looked at in the context of the, the abuse offence more generally in, in terms of is that behaviour, is there behaviour there that is, is deemed to be abusive and, and would constitute an offence in relation to, to that individual? Um, I just, there, there, there's something, clause 12, just, I, I get why it's there, it's just there's parts of it that doesn't sit well with me because in effect, we're kind of saying that it is reasonable for victims in certain circumstances to suffer harm. And, and, and that, unless it's tight in terms of not allowing behaviour to be said, oh, that's reasonable, even though it's their behaviour that's causing the harmful behaviour. I, I, I feel it just needs to be a little bit tighter. Um, but I, I, and I don't know how to do that. At least we, we have had lengthy discussions with both council and the departmental solicitor's office in relation to this because we were obviously aware of the concerns um, at a very early stage. Some suggestions have been made in some of the responses in terms of additional phrases and wording um, being included in the, the defence provision in, in terms of clause 12. The view that we took in relation to that is that in, in some respects the additional words and phrases could be deemed to be windy dressing in that they didn't materially change or um, impact on the, the thrust of the provision itself. So while it presentationally may provide, you know, may presentationally provide greater um, reassurance, it didn't actually materially change the legislative construct of the, the provision. And I, and I suppose to go back again to the, the experience in the other jurisdictions where this is in place, we certainly aren't getting indications from them um, that this is 
uh, is giving rise to significant issues in, in terms of cases being brought forward on, on the application of this, but fully appreciate the concerns um, that, that, that there are in, in relation to the provision more generally. As I say, I think one of the key things is really the fact that where this, um, has to, where this is used as a, a defence in relation to a particular case, it would have to be proved on, you know, or, or evidence provided on multiple occasions, um, you know, depending on the, the extent of the abusive behaviour that is there, which I think makes it much more difficult. You know, as I say, if you have an example of there's 10 incidents as part of the domestic abuse offence, um, for the domestic abuse offence not to apply, you would have to... Um, be providing evidence or, or give information in relation to nine of those incidents to essentially bring it below your two or more threshold. Okay. Um, Finally, just I suppose on the effects of Clause 12, um, has uh, what effects of the clause has been considered on court proceedings? Um, does it having this there take away the focus from the behaviour of the accused and put the emphasis back on the victim in terms of safeguarding the victim? through the reasonableness defence, could that be used to further traumatise victims through the use of, say, psychological assessment? Has that been considered? Our view would be that it should not have a, a material impact in, in relation to the proceedings itself. This type of provision is used in, in other legislation. It is not uniquely exposed to the domestic abuse offence. Um, in and of itself, and I suppose ultimately at the crux of this, before you get to the point where the defence is being applied, um, there will have to be evidence on information which means that both police and PPS are satisfied that there has been um, abusive behaviour, that there are grounds for a case to be taken forward and that there is robust information and evidence there. So we're, we don't consider that, that this should give rise to difficulties in, in that regard. Obviously, this is something that we'd be very keen, given the concerns that have been expressed around this, to, to, to monitor and keep under review as, as the offence is operationalised. OK, thank you. Sorry, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ch Chair, I, I do there have some reservations on this. I, I absolutely get it. You know, I think it's an important piece that does have to be in there um, for all the reasons that Paul raised and others. But I, I do wonder, in terms of um, a person who is being abused, and, you know, the abuser could be quite manipulative and over time have built up a profile on that person. Now, obviously, in the example given somebody with dementia, that's a medical opinion. But if um, a manipulative abuser has over time suggested um, a person, for example, is an addict, and they would be recommending they go for treatment, and the person said, well, I don't believe I am, and, and th they could build a profile of that person. And I just wonder what type of evidence would be used um, to garner, is it these two people being together is the problem, or is this really a profile of the individual? I just think it's a bit of a minefield, um, and I don't know how how far you can go in the depths of getting evidence to determine whether reasonableness in some cases is justifiable. In terms of that, that scenario, and, and in the context of taking cases forward, the focus at the outset is obviously going to be what is the evidence and information in relation to there being abusive behaviour in the first instance. The individual or the defendant will then have to provide information to um, or, or evidence um, so that the court is satisfied that the behaviour in those particular circumstances was reasonable. So the focus should be on their behaviour and, and what they have done as opposed to there being a, a focus or, or detriment to the individual that is being subject to the abuse. Yes, I do get that, but I think that measure can only be made if um, the the perpetrator or the, the abuser says, I had to do this because, and then that shines the light over to the person being abused, where they're trying to create a profile of that person that required that type of action. And there could have been a very manipulative build-up of the profile of that person to show them in a different light. I just think some vulnerable people could be made more vulnerable by this. And I do get the point. I, I you know, I, I can see the clear line on why um, it's obviously required, you know, because there are clear examples of where reasonableness does come into play. And I really can't find, even in my own head, where the balance is here. I 
suppose in, in terms of that and concerns about the impact on the individual, I probably would go back to and emphasise that point that in putting this forward as a defence, that individual will have to provide evidence. The court will have to be satisfied in terms of deeming that behaviour to have been reasonable given the particular circumstances of the case. And they will have to apply that in terms of the various incidents that make up the domestic abuse offence. So I think that makes it much more difficult in terms of um, the ability to manipulate or, or subject this provision to abuse. But as I say, I do fully appreciate the concerns that people have, have in relation to this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, clause 13. I don't have any issues on Clause 13. But Just, can I add on 13, Chair? Yeah. Because I know it's not down listed as a question. So, uh, again, an alternative availability for conviction. Why would we ever get the position where we're in a court and it's not proven until then that there's no personal connection? I think it's probably unlikely in practice. You would like to think that that, you know, police will obviously want to look at the information. PPS will be considering this. They will have to be satisfied in terms of the case being taken forward. I suppose the provision here is intended, and I suppose we envisage that it would largely be used in those scenarios where, as part of the proceedings, it's deemed that there isn't a personal connection between the two individuals so that there is, um, you know, a, another offence that the individual can be charged with if the various conditions have been met. I think it's probably, you know, the number of cases in which this will be used will probably be relatively small. Yeah. Um, but I suppose it, it was almost, it's a, a safeguard provision in a way that if during the proceedings, for whatever reason, um, it's deemed that the two individuals, there isn't a connection between them, and ultimately, if you don't have that, your domestic abuse offence as such falls. Um, we wanted to ensure that what would otherwise be abusive behaviour of a form um, could then be taken forward as another charge. And as we say, it's, it, it's likely to be the harassment provisions, and obviously, when the stalking provisions um, come forward, that would also be added in. Um, within clause 13, so it would. And, and it, it, is, it is it clear to the judiciary and everyone else involved in that that it will only be, I don't want to use the term relegated because it's, they're, they're serious offences too, but it's all about the personal connection and nothing else. So it wouldn't become a lower tier offence for a safer conviction by a prosecutor or by the police force of the PS? No. So it's certainly, you know, that would be very, you know, that is the, the purpose of the clause is essentially, you know, and, and we don't envisage it um, arising in, in other situations. We think the crux of it is going to be law, you know, inability to prove the personal connection. If that doesn't happen, it's then to ensure that that behaviour can be, can be addressed. Certainly, um, you know, none of us would want to see a situation where essentially alternative convictions were being used and were deemed, albeit, as you say, unrightly so, very serious offences in and of themselves, um, you know, that, that it was deemed to be a, a lesser charge, for want of a better phrase. OK, thank you. OK, clause 14. Um, in terms of the penalties, and I've, I've noted some of the people had raised issues around sentencing, but that's something that's going to be taken forward through the operate, operate operationalisation of the legislation. Um, is that something that the department position, does it support sentencing guidelines for the new offence? I think certainly we would be keen. Um, I think for, for any parties that are, are subject to taking the new domestic abuse offence forward that there's guidance, guidelines, some form of documentation which will assist um, in relation to that. So certainly we would be keen um, that there are sentencing guidelines associated with this um, and, and certainly the sense that we get from the discussions we've had with Judicial Studies Board, I think that's likely to be something that will be considered as part of the process um, going forward and, and is a, a fairly standard um, aspect for them in, in relation to, to new charges or new offences. Okay. Clause 15 members, aggravation as to domestic abuse, I have no questions. 16, what amounts to aggravation again, I don't have any questions. 17's exception regarding the aggravation, I'm content. Eighteen, the meaning of a personal connection. Any members, any questions on the scope of that area? Content. Okay. There were no issues raised 
on 19 from witnesses 20 how the notice is to be served the issues members 21 no right to claim by jury I know that's an area that was raised but I've I've noted the department's written response to that so I am content 22 um, special measures directions just a couple of questions um, <clears throat> the Lord Chief Justice's position on uh, the proposed amendment to require court rules enabling court hearing civil proceedings to make for special measure directions has he been asked for a view and has he given it uh, yes so the minister uh, wrote uh, to the Lord Chief Justice and in fact his response was received just just yesterday uh, so I think um, from the judicial perspective um, in general terms the Lord Chief Justice is content but um, the Minister will obviously want to consider the, the detail of, of the response and once we've had an opportunity to do that we can update um, the committee further in terms of um, the proposed amendment that we're, we're considering. Okay. It'd be helpful for us to get sight of that, obviously, um, in terms of the Lord Chief Justice's position on it. Um, any operational issues that would prevent special measures being put in place on the day of the court hearing? So if someone asks for them or they're directed to provide them, I suppose what we're, we're hoping in, in terms of that provision more generally is that that issue will be considered much earlier um, as, as part of the process. The provision is, is obviously providing that there's automatic eligibility for consideration for special measures in relation to domestic abuse cases, so whether it's a domestic abuse offence or an aggravated um, case. So that, that should be considered ahead of time, both at police stage and in terms of video recorded evidence and in terms of the PPS side of things, in terms of having those provisions and arrangements in place. Um, we would like to think that it should reduce um, instances where special measures are only being raised on, on the day of the, the case coming forward. Um, there may be particular reasons given the, the circumstances of the case as to, as to why that may occur, but I suppose what the provision is intended to do to ensure that that is a, a, a much more integral part of the process going forward. Obviously, it will be for the, the judge to determine um, in the particular case whether or not the special measures are granted, but, but hopefully through that automatic eligibility for consideration, it, it should improve that process. And ha has there been issues in the past in terms of people wanting to have special member measures in place and it not being granted to them? I suppose, you know, again, ultimately that will be for the judge to determine. So there, there will have been instances, I am sure, where individuals may want special measures, but they, you know, the judge has taken the decision that those aren't to be granted for, for whatever reason. And, and I suppose ultimately that is, is within their remit as opposed to something that can be forced on them. Okay. Um, there were no issues raised in 23 and 24, clause 25, the guidance around domestic abuse. Um, so the depart we've prepared a draft yeah. of that guidance. Um, as we've indicated, a task and finish group will be set up to take a look at that. We want to include both our statutory and voluntary sector partners in relation to that. Um, you know, I think the, the guidance in, in terms of accompanying the offence and the awareness raising in, in terms of a, a media campaign is going to be critical in, in terms of getting information out to people, making sure that practitioners are aware of, of what constitutes the offence, what is abusive behaviour. So as I say, we will be working with police, PPS, um, as well as our voluntary and community sector partners in relation to the content of that guidance, and we'll want that very much to be shaped um, by them. Um, the department will provide that, that first draft um, to them, but we will very much want them to shape the content of that and ensure that they are content with um, the coverage and scope of that. Okay, it's just the wording of it that around May issue guidance, I suppose it's just when you see that in legislation, it means the department may not, but it may do. Um, and certainly it's very much our intention that there will be guidance that will be published, will be publicly available. Yeah. Um, while possibly not of, of much comfort in, in terms of the phrasing, I think that's fairly standard terminology. Yeah. Um, in, in term, you know, and obviously from a, a departmental perspective, it would never be our intention not to have guidance available yeah. and, and published, but, but do appreciate that in, in terms of the, the use of the term may. Yeah, it's, um, I, I suspect it is general 
general drafting that's common in, in legislation. Um, <coughs> that guidance, that can just be published as the department is able to publish it, or is it brought in through a legislative vehicle? No, it'll essentially that will that will be prepared and, and brought forward. It'll be um, laid at the assembly. I think is is fairly standard practice in relation to um, guidance that's provided for in, in statute, but doesn't need any further um, legislative provision in relation to it. Okay, um, and your time frame for for the guidance being in place. We'll obviously want that you know to have been finalised well in advance of the the offence being. Um, introduced, as I say, the, the first meeting of um, that task and finish group is going to be held later this month. So mm-hmm. I would imagine the guidance should probably be more or less finalised by the time the, the legislation is finished going through the Assembly. And as, as the guidance gets worked up, once it's agreed with all of the relevant agencies, it's making sure then those that are going to be on the cold face dealing with it have been adequately trained. Yeah. Is that being factored into the, the planning of when it comes live, I suppose, and you know, and again, it's something that, that Anthony may want to comment on. <coughs> Obviously, the, the police will be heavily involved in um, preparing the guidance, but yes, that will be need to be an integral part of any training that organisations are taking forward um, in terms of both training around um, the, the new offence more generally, but also in terms of awareness raising in relation to guidance and, and that people know it is, you know, it's, it's very much intended as a tool to assist them in, in relation to the progression of, of cases. Okay. Rachel. Thanks, Chair. Um, sort of on the same points as, as you, just in terms of the, I mean, it is just a common legislation writing to say May, but I think it would be better if the department will publish guidance. Um, and in terms, just to clarify that currently the wording in Clause 25, it's the powers conferred in the Department of Justice to issue guidance is not subject to any Assembly control or scrutiny, or it is. No, it's not. It's not. Okay. Sorry. That so wasn't it clear. would be laid in the assembly, but we would have no chance to, you know, if there was say, problems. What about reviews of the guidance? I suppose know, that that will be an integral part of the process going forward. Um, I suppose, for for want of a better phrase, it will to a certain extent be a living document. You know, that's something we'll obviously have um, formal evaluations, um, review the policy, the intent behind it, etc. You know, so we'll want to have ongoing discussions with. Um, partner organisations once the offence is brought forward, both in terms of how it's operating, but also taking a look at whether or not there's anything further needs to be done in terms of that guidance, so to provide further clarity, um, more examples, if there are any difficulties being um, encountered by operational organisations, you know, we'll obviously want to keep that that under um, periodic review. And I suppose as well the fact that it's not subject to um, an assembly legislative vehicle as such makes that easier in, in terms of reviewing that guidance as and when needed. Okay. And just Ben, in terms of the, um, the it, there's a task and finish group meeting on this at the end of the month. Is there any indication of who's going to be on that? Um, police, PPS, um, the likes of Women's Aid, Men's Advisory Project. You know, kind of. I suppose the the key partners that we would have in terms of taking um, policy development forward more generally. Um, they'll be be part of that group. Paul? Yeah, just very quick. On the same lines as yourselves, uh, I, I'm perplexed as to why it's a may and not a will or a must. Um, and again, I note the fact that it doesn't have to come back to scrutiny uh, or operation with regards to the Assembly. But is there, is there guidelines on the guidelines as to when you would review something like this uh, periodically? Uh, or do you, do you assess court cases? How do you, how do you know it's time to review? Should that not be placed in legislation? I suppose the difficulty, I, I can certainly see the merit and benefit of having something in legislation in relation to having periodic reviews of the legislation. I think the difficulty is, depending on where you're at in the process, so certainly at the outset and in the first few years, I think that's something that you <coughs> want to keep under review fairly regularly. You know, so you may do something 12, 18 months or, or whatever it may be in, um, do something again 12, 18 months after that. And once you would kind of get to a point where the, the offence is fairly well established, you may have a much longer gap could for argument's sake be five years. So I think I suppose that would be the only difficulty in terms of making provision in relation to um, review of the guidance and legislation that it could bind you and, and force reviews to be undertaken at times when it's it's not necessarily um, appropriate. 
But certainly it's something, you know, and I think again as, as part of the engagement with um, both statutory and voluntary and community sector partners more generally, you know, I think through those discussions um, on, on review of, on monitoring of the measure more generally, you know, I, I'd like to think we'll have a fairly good feel as to, to when the guidance needs to be reviewed or adjusted. Um, and obviously we'll want to take into account um, the views of operational partners on the ground in, in terms of how it's working or, or not working um, for them. Okay, thank you, Chair. Linda? My question has actually been answered to, to Paul. I just I do think that the guidelines, guidelines and guidance in any of these legislative pieces is so vitally important, particularly to those who will be dealing with it operationally and in terms of training. So we want to make sure it is right. And as a committee, whilst we don't necessarily have a scrutinising role of that, we're here to help, we're here to assist, we're here to only add to. We're not, we're not going to want to take away from that. We're not going to want to... Um, demean it in any way, so I think that it, it will be important if we can get side of it before obviously the legislation goes through. That's going to be helpful to us, but I certainly think that if we feel changes need to be made to it, I'd like to think that that, that will be done because yeah. we would only be doing no, something certainly. that's to the benefit or the positive yeah, in relation to, to the that guidance. wider good. I'm more than happy, you know, with, as you indicate, for that guidance to be shared with the committee in, in due course. Thank you. At this stage, we don't have. A sense as to when it may be finalised, um, but as I say, more than no, unhappy that, that that comes back to the committee. E even without the legal requirement to issue guidance, you would, all of the relevant authorities involved in this will have to have guidance for its own practitioners. So, yeah. in one sense, it's stating the obvious because you're not going to pass legislation that the police or mm -hmm. PPS are all aren't going to then look at and say, yeah. how do we now operate this? Um, yeah, as yes. you say, you're, you're never going to have a situation where we won't have guidance yeah. and operational partners will also have kind of their, their own take on that as yeah. such. Yeah. Okay. Clause 26, prohibition of cross-examination in person. I have no issues on that. There were no issues raised on uh, 27 and 28 either. And I think that is us. Okay. So thank, thank you. Very much. much appreciated. Um, and it goes without saying, of course, we're more than happy to come back to the committee at any point, you know, or, or answer any further queries that you may have in relation to the bill and its provisions. Okay. No. Thank you. And there was a couple of areas there. If you can just come back to us as soon as possible, it would be appreciated. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Oh. Members, well, we will at next week's meeting. Obviously, this will be compiled for members, and then we're going to go through informally um, our own deliberations on the bill um, in terms of the areas that we've covered today to establish um, informally the agreement or otherwise of the committee um, to the uh, the main parts of the bill that have been outlined today. Okay, and. The outworking of that will then generate its own work stream. So we will come back to this next Thursday and we will work through those clauses and seek to get committee positions on them. Okay, we're going to take a quick comfort break and we'll reconvene at a quarter to one and hopefully we will um, finish the rest of the business by half one. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the North. Okay, members, um, we'll reconvene. Okay, item nine, uh, pages 100, 450 to 569 of your meeting pack for the relevant papers. At our meeting on the 23rd of June, the committee considered further information provided by the department on the position in relation to counterterrorism and sentencing bill and the proposed approach by the UK Government to apply retrospectively provisions in a previous bill to remove the automatic right to early release within Northern Ireland. 
To assist its considerations of the issue, the Committee requested further information on a number of matters, including how this will interfere with licensing procedures. Here, clarification of concerns regarding young, young offenders, details of human rights implications, advice or views received from the Human Rights Commission and the Attorney General, and copies of operational and security assessments. The Committee also asked the Minister to detail the evidence to support her view that an LCM would not gather the necessary support in the Assembly. The Department has provided the Minister's response to the Committee's queries, along with all other uh, relevant information. Um, with regard to an LCM in the Bill, the Minister states that she has exercised her political judgment of the potential for this to be a divisive issue, and may not therefore garner the required support in the Assembly. The Minister has, however, indicated that she will engage with the Executive when the Ministry of Justice response and final position on the concerns that she has highlighted is received. The Minister states that she would uh, not support an LCM for the Bill in its entirety, but would be content to secure support to table a limited LCM to enable prospective clauses within the Bill to be operationalised in Northern Ireland, excluding uh, the provisions relating to polygraph testing. The Minister has advised that she is going to keep this committee up to date on development. So, members, I am asking that we would note the current position and uh, we will consider this when we are in receipt of further information from the Minister. Read. Item 10, the Attorney General's Human Rights Guidance, um, pages 5, 7, 1 of the meeting pack and 7 of the tabled uh, paper. The Committee considered the statutory rule at its meeting on 30 June and agreed that it had no objection to the rule subject to the examiner's report. The examiner of stat rules will formally report on this rule in her next report, which is due to be published on the 4th of September. Um, however, plenary sittings over the summer recess have impact, impacted on the statutory period, and the committee must consider any technical issues raised today to allow for a motion to annul to be tabled and debated within the statutory uh, period if this is required. So, to facilitate this, the examiner has provided her views in advance of publication of the report. And these are included in the table pack. The examiner has advised that the 21-day rule was breached, as the rule was made on the 23rd of June and came into operation on the 29th of June. The examiner notes that the AG explained that this is because his tenure ended on the 30th of June, and that the committee was briefed on the rule in advance of it being laid. The examiner, therefore, is content in this instance. Uh, if members are content to note the examiner of statutory rules comments on the technical aspects of the rule. Noted. Right. Item 11, um, COVID-19 recovery plan, page 573-605. Following the oral evidence session with officials on the Department's COVID-19 response and recovery planning on the 4th of June, the Committee agreed to request a copy of the Department's uh, recovery plan, as well as further information on the recovery plans for the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service and other justice bodies or agencies. The Department has provided a copy of its latest version of its recovery plan and an update on recovery planning in relation to the Courts and Tribunal Service, the Prison Service and the Youth Justice Agency. So, members, if there is any further information needed on this area, um, I was going to, to request that we get some more information on what the backlog now is within our court system. Mm. Uh, anecdotally, it's an area that some people have been raising with me, so I was keen that we would um, ask for information as to what the, the backlog currently is, covering criminal, civil and um, family cases, and how this differs pre and post COVID-19. So if members are content, we'll seek some further information in that area. Chair, I think we should. The other point, what about having some of the officials back for a, an update? Well, it's one that we're, we're keeping under constant review as to how that emerges. So um, if you're content, Gordon, we'll, we'll bring them back whenever we identify a slot. OK, right. Thank you. Item 12, um, June monitoring and COVID-19 re reprioritisation exercise, 615 to 674. Department has provided an update on the outcome of the June 2020 monitoring round and COVID-19 reprioritisation exercise. The Department has, was allocated £13.5 million of the bids submitted at that time to manage COVID-19 pressures. Um, they are left with £3.78 million to manage 
in year in a subsequent funding exercise. A further resource dial bid of 5.6 million was made, which relates to pressures for the prison service and the police service uh, from changes to the working time directive that resulted in potential increases in unused leave. A capital dial bid has also been made for the prison service relating to learning and skills at McGabry, a perimeter wall at McGilligan, and uh, investment into uh, the women's facility. Um, members, the forward work programme, uh, which is uh, in the pack uh, today, includes a briefing on the main estimates and the review of the financial processes uh, in September and a briefing uh, on October 2020 monitoring and an update on the spending review in October. So, if members are content that we would note the updated um, position uh, in the meantime. Great. Item 13, amendments to judicial cooperation and no deal statutory instruments required before the end of the transition periods. Uh, a number of UK wide judicial cooperation stat instruments were made to ensure a functioning statute book in the event that the United Kingdom left the European Union without a deal. These dealt with police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters and judicial cooperation in civil and commercial matters. Amendments are now required to ensure compliance with provisions in the withdrawal agreement. The Department has advised that these are technical amendments ensuring compliance with the United Kingdom's international obligations or to correct minor deficiencies such as amending references to exit day and uh, it involves no policy decisions. Um, there are three of these that are expected. These will correct deficiencies in the civil and family no deal, ensure withdrawal agreement compliance with ongoing criminal cases, uh, only some aspects of which are devolved, and ensure compliance for ongoing civil and family cases. The Department advises that the Minister considers um, uh, that these should extend to Northern Ireland, given that they are purely technical and uh, they are amending um, current instruments that are UK-wide, and many of the amendments are made to United Kingdom-wide statutes. So the Department has advised that it will engage separately with the Committee on further uh, No Deal SIEs relating to firearms and explosives. So, members, if you are content that we would note this position, unless there is further information needed or comment to be made, if not, we will move on. Item 4, Access NI proposed amendments to the filtering scheme. Uh, page 671 to 678. The Department has written regarding amendments to the Access NI filtering scheme. In March, the Minister gave consideration to a scheme where no Access NI certificate should disclose information about non court disposals given to young people. The Minister is, however, concerned that a policy where there is a blanket non disclosure of youth NCDs could potentially. Uh, cause a safeguarding risk to vulnerable groups. In reaching this view, the Minister has taken account of a recommendation by the Independent Reviewer of Criminal Record Information in her 2019-20 uh, annual report. The Minister has decided that no such information should be disclosed before it is independently scrutinised by the Department's Independent Reviewer of Criminal Record Certificates. This means that disclosure could still be made of a youth non-court disposal where the uh, independent reviewer believed that non-disclosure could undermine the safeguarding or protection of children and vulnerable adults or pose a risk of harm to the public. And the Minister has requested the views of the Committee on the proposed policy, which will require an amendment to primary legislation um, that would uh, be intended for inclusion in the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. So, members, it's just to seek your views on this area, Linda. Yeah, just a quick question that I think we should put. Was the Children's Commissioner consulted in relation to it? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm happy to, that we would ask it. For, from looking at it from my own perspective, I have no personal um, disagreement with what the Minister is trying to do in respect of this and would be supportive of it, um, but I'm happy to get clarity. I, I'm on in the same position, but I, I just would like to, to know if the Children's Commissioner has been consulted. Just following on from that, in terms of the views, other views that the ministers sought, sort of Nicky, um, but the Youth Justice Agency, and then you know if there's any other youth organisations that would maybe have an interest in this, um, if they had been consulted. But again, it's just to see if they have. Okay. Well, I'm happy that we would ask the department if there's views from the relevant stakeholders in this area on what's being proposed. 
Okay, item 15 then, Committee Forward Work Programme, pages 680 to 693 of the meeting pack has the relevant papers. The Department was asked to provide details of the items of work that it intends to bring forward between September and December of this year and to assist with our uh, consideration of our Forward Work Programme. This information has been received together with a list of specific items of business the Department wishes to schedule during September and details of the Department's planned legislative programme for the rest of the mandate, which includes four bills in addition to the current bill that we're considering on domestic abuse and family proceedings. Uh, the work items to be brought forward um, by the Department together with the planned introduction of two bills before the end of the year um, will be a very substantial workload for the Committee. As requested by the Committee in June, uh, there will be a briefing by the Chief Constable and Senior Officers on EU exiting issues and other placing priorities and policy issues, which will take place on the 24th of September. So, if members are content, we will schedule the written briefing papers that uh, have been requested by the Department for our meetings in September, um, with the caveat that priority is being given to completing the committee stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. And if necessary, we will defer uh, those written papers for subsequent meetings to enable us to complete the work on the bill. And also, members, an informal discussion on the forward work programme and priorities for the rest of the year and into early 2021. We will arrange in October um, once we get the domestic abuse um, and family proceedings bill. Uh, dealt with, and that will allow us to, to give more detailed consideration of all of the areas that the committee needs to, to handle. If members are content with that approach. Great. Uh, item 16, correspondence. There's 29 items of correspondence um, on pages 697 through to 1263 of your meeting pack. I'm only going to draw attention to two of them. Um, item 20. Uh, is a report from the Criminal Justice Inspection for Northern Ireland on the care and treatment of victims and witnesses by the criminal justice system in Northern Ireland. The report highlights that while improvements have been made over the past decade, victim and witness care is still not sufficiently tailored to individual needs and consistently delivered to a quality standard across Northern Ireland, and it makes four strategic and 12 operational uh, recommendation, recommendations. Um, members, we just intend to provide the committee with a copy of the action plan to address the report finding, findings and recommendations. Um, we will look at this in October. It's an area where this committee in previous mandates carried out an extensive inquiry, made recommendations, and if members are content, we will schedule an oral briefing on the report's findings, recommendations, and then once we're in possession of the response from the department as to how they're dealing with it, um, we'll schedule an oral briefing session to take place in this area. Uh, the other item then um, is item 19, National Crime Agency Annual Report and Accounts of 2019-20. Um, the committee has in the past scheduled meetings uh, to look at serious organised crime and we've brought the relevant um, agencies to come to the meeting. So again, with no date in mind, um, but it would be appropriate to schedule an oral briefing um, with the National Crime Agency, Police Service and other relevant organisations in line with similar handling arrangements that the committee has used in this area. If members are content, we'll action then all of the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet. If there's any comments in respect of any individual item. Item 19, Chair, sure, that will, will that come back to us at a later date. The, the issue from CARE about the introduction of uh, Places of Worship Protection Scheme for Northern Ireland. Yeah. That when will we, come back. Yes, when we get the response from the department, right. um, then it'll be... It'll be brought back to members' attention. Right, thank you. A, num a number of the items are similar, that we're, we're seeking information, and then we'll be able to consider it. Okay, Chairman's business, other than to thank the staff, um, because you got a report today of nearly 1,300 pages, and um, the way in which the uh, consideration of the bill was carried out, 
that kind of table just doesn't happen. Um, it requires a huge amount of work, and I know over the summer, um, all of the information that the committee had been looking at and evidence gathering was all compiled, broken down, engaged with the department on, pulled together in order to facilitate us as members. I appreciate members have been busy um, reading through it all and, and getting on top of it, but I just want to to put on record on behalf of everyone in the committee appreciation to to the team in the office and um, for all of the work that they have been doing while still trying to, to get some kind of holiday leave during that period. So um, as chairman, thank you. Um, it's always much appreciated um, in terms of the work that takes place. Um, any other business? Yes. Linda. On, on the same note, just to thank the staff for, for doing it and for putting it together. And I know you said some challenges on Tuesday as well, getting it out. Chair, just for us as members in terms of scrutiny, in terms of time management, I would have to say with the, with the kind of bulk of work that we have to do and the papers that we have to go through, it's difficult to do this on a, on a Thursday morning. And I'm wondering, is there any thinking around returning to do it on a Thursday afternoon just to give us a wee bit more time? There is, in, in respect, we've been tied in. And this is through no fault of the staff. It's just the, it's just the bulk of work that's come to the committee. It's, it's, it's not well, I know normally members will, will get it uh, in advance of the time frame that we got it for this meeting, and then there was a lot of papers. We're still operating with the potential for the ad hoc committee on COVID-19, which would meet on a Thursday afternoon. And, and so that's the basis on which we were meeting on in the mornings. Um, I haven't got an update yet as to whether that committee is going to be null and void. Um, but it was to give us flexibility that if that was called, then we weren't sitting in the Justice Committee without the ability to have things recorded and um, the media and so on being published of uh, the proceedings of the meeting. So if that changes, well then yes, you know, we can look at how we, we schedule meetings in the future. But for the rest of September, we were going with this time frame. Um, and I'm content that it goes for the rest of for the rest of September, just because I have to chair the procedures, which is on the Thursday this month. But um, I just think maybe if we can if we can find out what is the situation going to be going forward, because it is it is a challenge yeah. to try and get through the papers. And um, I mean, I had to just take yesterday and do nothing else. But yeah. you're not going to be able to do that every. Every week on a Wednesday, just was fortunate enough to be able to do it this week. So I think that yeah, I think my just, just to allow that, yeah. and in fairness to the staff that are putting that paperwork together, I think the very least they can expect is that we're going to read it, we're going to use it in terms of this, the scrutiny role of this committee. So I think my understanding is there was going to be a discussion about the COVID nineteen ad hoc committee. I'm not sure whether it was yesterday at business committee, but they they were looking at it as there's going to be a review. So. Thank you. Okay, so we will meet same day next week, 10 a.m. And I think we are in here. Yeah, Senate Chamber. Okay, thank you, members. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. <laughs>